um, I'm going to start out with um, with a bestseller poem, which I thought. You know, the problem is that you don't see bestseller books by poets very much. Uh, Billy Collins, maybe you heard once in a while, but, but uh, you know, look at the New York Times bestseller list, and you don't see poems there much for uh, reasons that, that we need not go into right now. But, um, I thought I wanted to sort of uh, break with the crowd and write a bestseller poem, so I was I was you know, I was trying to figure out uh, the approach. You have to have a, a sort of an angle sometimes for a bestseller, and, and I noticed that self-help books are quite often on the bestseller list, and, and so I decided a self-help poem would be. <laughs> And um, once again, I think you need an angle for self-help. You know, I'm okay, you're okay, or you know, how to get in touch with your feelings and ten easy lessons or five hard ones, uh, um, that kind of thing. And uh, they seem to be all used up. And I was stuck to tell. Uh, this is a poem written a while ago. Um, a uh, an Olympian named Mark Spitz, a, a swimmer, uh, was the first, I think, American to win huge numbers of gold medals in one Olympic. He won seven gold medals in one Olympic, and this was like international news. And um, uh, a CBS or ABC uh, had a show called Wide Worlds of Sports, as you may have seen, and, and they were roaming around interviewing people about what they thought about Mark Spitz winning seven gold medals at the Olympics. This was, these were Americans talking, and uh, it turned out that they thought it was good. <laughs> so we heard this again and again until they got to the last guy who said this about it. Uh, big deal. If I could swim as good as him, I'd win a lot of gold medals too. <laughs> so, uh, it seems to all the way you look at But there's my angle, so. <laughs> so, help. Let's get mad, fellow losers. Fellow flops, fellow dust eaters, fellow weepers, fellow had a wife and couldn't keep hers. <laughs> Let's get mad and bad and high in the stirrups. They never liked us, never gave us diddly when we needed a break. Who the hell are they anyway? A hundred thousand softies tops. Moping over their pity floors, worried that the help these days is getting just too uppity to lick a boot. That, or that the snowpack at Aspen might be, well, simply intolerable. We're billions strong, tough as dandelions, raised on humble pie and hind tit. And we've had a belly full up to our eyeballs. Don't forget, without us, winning's obsolete. <laughs> so let's knock off the oohs and ahs, the encores, the Wall Street Journal. Let them play the Super Bowl to an empty Superdome. Let the election results read zero to zero. <laughs> Let them fight the next war by their lonesome with caviar and empty Mouton Rothschild bottles. Boycott got their movies, their mouthwashes, their douchebags, their life insurance, and grinning eight by 10 glossies. We'll show them what losing's like. Put the boots to them. Head them off at the pass. Trap them in a box canyon. Take their children hostage and teach little snots our primitive ways. <laughs> to say, oh well, and what's the use when they take the wrong turn off, bobble a punt, borrow from the guy with the two big friends named principal and interest. <laughs> Leave them with nothing to fall back on but a rock and a hard place. The devil in the deep blue sea, chaos and old night, aces and eights, household finance and the reader's digest sweepstakes. And let their letters all begin with, dear applicant, Thank you for letting us see your resume. <laughs> or, dear customer, a good credit rating is a serious responsibility, not a right. <laughs> we've got the bench, we've got general admission, we've got bad stomach, bad arches, bad checks, bad timing, bad luck, bad news, and the worst, the very worst intentions. Remember, wrong way Corrigan, General Burgoyne, Harold Stassen, Pickett's Charge, Troy Donahue, Troy. Yetzel, <laughs> Leisure Suits, Dynaflo, the Maginot Line, and Casey at the Bat, not to mention Uncle Saul and his worm farm. <laughs> Let's reach down for that minus 10%, that faulty premise, those visions and revisions, that bushly, cockeyed, backfiring, two left footed shit for brain urge to go out there and do something. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
I had the uh, misfortune of uh, being forced to participate in a satanic rite with my um, oldest son, uh, known as the Pinewood Derby. <laughs> This is, this is uh, something that, that shouldn't be imposed. It's supposed to be a, a father-son bonding kind of thing. They, they give you this box that's got a, a block of wood, four wheels, and two wires to put the wheels on, and you're supposed to construct a, a car with this, um, cunningly wrought by you and your son, and then it's, um, uh, there you all take it to the Pinewood Derby where they have this incline, it's like a soapbox derby, and little miniature things in and they race and, and they give trophies to the winners and uh, uh, so we did we did our we got it built and it was kind of lopsided and, and uh, but we got it all, all the parts were kind of fitting and everything and the wheels worked and so we took it to the Pinewood Derby and I'm um, looking at the competition and like there are these like streamlined things with flame jobs on them and uh, guys you know look like look like pit crews that come with them and, and, and it turns out that there's a big secret you put graphite in the uh, in the in the axle so they go faster so we're screwed and, and, uh, we lost uh, bad and rather than bonding i think we kind of held it against each other <laughs> disaster so i wrote this poem to kind of uh, please with my imagination Fix things up a little bit. It's called Father and Son Project 22 Model Airplane Building. Um, these are plastic airplanes because they're easier to build. Um, okay. Plastic ailerons, struts, antennae sprawl about fragile as hummingbird bones. Bull face warns to avoid damage, tweezers are required in handling the smaller parts. We break four pieces in assemblage A, squirt an ounce of glue on instrument panel, join tab C inseparably to tab N, <laughs> spill tang across a sheet of filigree decals. Grr, I say, belching up a taste of meatloaf. Grr, he replies, his new incisor bared. <laughs> Aroused, I grab a wing, bite through it, Munch thoughtfully. He snaps the tail in two, then seizes a small gray pilot and chews off an arm. Yum, he grunts. Coarse fur sprouts from his ears, his forehead, as my great black snout probes the wreckage. Our dog snuffles in, stares, whimpers out. Just before the rampage, we claw, bite, tear the rest of bloody scrap. He nips at my ear, asking for more. I snort, cuff him gently across the rug. <coughs> Refreshed on frenzy, Papa and baby sniff the air, lumber off toward the kitchen. <laughs> my, um, I wrote a whole book from the, uh, we were talking about persona poems, and um, I have a whole book of poems written from the point of view of King Kong. It was the only thing I could come up with as, you know, Shannon has got the wolf, you know, that a wolf is going to be a dignified thing to write about, but uh, King Kong's the only animal I can think of, so, um, what the hell, um, so, I'll read you a couple of these. This is, um, the sort of introductory poem to the book, and, um, it's, it deals with King Kong before what you see in the movie. He's, he's still on the island there. He hasn't been invaded by the guys who are trying to take him back to New York and make him into a showbiz uh, uh, equipment. And um, it always seemed to me kind of funny that, uh, uh, you know, I never saw any girl gorillas on the island, you know, or even his mom and dad, you know, he seemed to be able to put gorilla on the island. And I was kind of wondering, you know, and it seemed to me he'd be kind of a lonely guy there because only the, the only the yearly virgin sacrifice that he gets to have and, and uh, other than that um, so it's kind of trying to think what what he might do before all this stuff in the movie happened and you know uh, so I thought he might do maybe possibly a little cross species thing and, and hang out with, with something uh, you know somebody who's uh, his size like a Tyrannosaurus Rex and so uh, this is called Kong Bears His Soul regarding Miss Tyrannosaurus Regina uh, because, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex, if you've had high school Latin, you know, that's a, that's a masculine ending, so you have to change it to a girl ending, so. <laughs> so all this is calm talking. 
So, we're not the perfect royal couple. Me, a hermit, and her temperamental is a hot volcano, and not what you'd call pretty. <laughs> Standoffish, too, as if warm blood and opposable thumbs were true low, too lowbrow for dining out on stegosaurus guts. <laughs> Maybe I could wear my hair shorter, get a tailpiece, learn to hiss and bolt my food. Maybe then I'd find the nerve to crush her boyfriend's spine and ask her out. <laughs> I should know better, but those eyes, so green and deep, you hardly notice her head is two-thirds teeth. <laughs> I don't know. Last night, I dreamed of someone lovelier, swept in from the sea, gold and tufted like a bird of paradise, who needed rescuing from pterodactyls and teeny-weeny white men, <laughs> and sang to Kong in a voice so high it broke his heart. <laughs> Um, Kong is, of course, a movie star, and movie stars have agents. <laughs> so I kind of, well, I listen in on a conversation between Kong and his agent having a power lunch there in Hollywood. <laughs> this is King Kong, discusses King Kong 4 over a power lunch. Um, you might remember, there's a little allusion to this poem, there's a scene that was censored out of the original Kong movie, this, I'm talking about the 1933 one. Uh, where he rips Fay Ray's clothes off and begins sniffing them, that the panty sniffing scene it's called, has been restored, thank goodness. <laughs> King Kong discusses King Kong 4 over a power lunch. He said he'd need 15%, and I said, okay. He said that included the revenues on the after marketing, and I said, okay. And he said we'd have to do more with the anti colonialism thing, and I said, I could see that. And we'd have to punch up the kinky sex thing. And I said, okay, I guess. <laughs> and the gory special effects, and I said, if we have to. And the clothes sniffing scene, I said, isn't that part of the kinky sex thing? And he said, maybe he should explain kinky to me. <laughs> and I said, maybe he should. <laughs> and he did. And I said, shouldn't stuff like that go into the gory special effects? <laughs> And he said, what kind of writer are you? And I said, a poet. And he said, he'd have his girl get in touch with my girl. And I said, he could have his girl keep her paws to herself. And I flicked his kinky little ass with a lobster bisque. Paul <laughs> gets angry every once in a while. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to do a high-risk poem. I hope you'll indulge me if I fall over. Um, I'm not really known for my hip-hop sort of stuff, um, or my rap things, but this one kind of came out that way, and so I will try to do it. It needs to be done a certain way. There are references to some old 60s dances, the Pony and the Boogaloo and stuff like that, and also some traditional dances like the Tarantella and the Pavan, um, and this is called the Kong, and the Kong is a dance. The Kong, do the Kong. There's also a reference to an old coasters song called uh, Charlie Brown, which has a little right here, why is everybody always picking on me? So, so here goes. It's a busting out dance when new sensation is your game, like if you washed your heart with lye and wrapped your head in cellophane. It's the Kong. Not the monkey or the swim, it's called the Kong. You got to be a little dim, like a guy in the coasters or a cootie or a flea. You'll say, why is everybody always picking on me? You'll do the Kong. Not the blue or our pony, genuine. Don't accept no phony. You look a little funny in a cargo net, but don't start bitching. That's as good as it'll get. Could be the Kong, <laughs> not the mashed potato. Get it on. You know it ain't Plato. You're going to see Manhattan with its Savoir Fair, but you'll end up on your head after conging on thin air. Blame the Kong. Not the, scratch a lot and slap your chest. I said the Kong, not the Walter Menuet. You'll be a better ape for it. Just you wait and see when you're a major movie star and get rerun on TV. Thank the Kong. Not the Pavane or Tarantella, yeah, the Kong. You could dance it in the cellar all night long. Don't need no song. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. <laughs> I 
assume you've all seen uh, The Godfather, and, um, and in Godfather 2 there's that chilling scene where um, um, Don Corleone, not Don Corleone, it's, it's uh, Michael, Michael Corleone, uh, who's now the Godfather, uh, discovers that Fredo has betrayed the family and uh, is going to have him killed, his own brother. And it's traditional in mafia land to uh, deliver what is called the kiss of death uh, to the person you're going to kill uh, or have killed. And so uh, this poem is called The Kiss of Death. <coughs> The kiss of death is a family kiss, blood to blood, Michael Corleone gripping brother Fredo by the chops and planting a big one to signify the ancient meaning. You're fucking dead. I love you. The original mixed message passed branch to branch of the family weeping, weeping willow since Cain and Absalom. Like the last kiss, I gave my father lightly on his forehead as he lay gowned and diapered in his last room, his skin damp, his mind cornered by something bad come home to grill him every waking hour. Maybe by the dream I had where I finally threw a punch and kept it up till I snapped awake. Or maybe by a dream he had about his father that mostly loving man, who he said would sometimes punish with a razor strop, once till grandma screamed and kiss him afterwards. My father taught himself to flail with words and silences, his kisses stabbed. I love you, Dad. I lied to no one in particular before I left, wiping off the blade meaning every word. I did want to get a couple of fool poems in. I read a bunch this morning, and uh, for those of you who weren't there, fool is a, is a, a character I write about, and he's uh, part of the fool archetype, which has been around and will be around forever and ever. This one is called the Fool Tree. It was called the Fool Tree. Okay. The Fool Tree. This is a, I often wrote a book called The Metamorphosis, which I thought was kind of nice. I read a Metamorphosis poem about Fool. <coughs> Poof. Like that. He's rooted 30 feet into the seventh green. Feeling the chilly nudge of worms, the tickle of mole whiskers and assorted cilia. Where did this five iron go? Where, for God's sake, did his arms, his eyes, his you know what? Maybe he should have tried a mashy. Does Blue Cross cover acute rooting? He doesn't care. Why move from this spot, he wonders. Ever. Why not dine on the seasons, waltz in the tuck of breezes, tango in gales? His skin's gnarled hard enough to blunt any slur or worry. His twiggy pate will leaf out every year. Tall, he, mu he muses, ancient, anchored, majestic. His thick bark, deaf to the chainsaws choke and rattle. What's called wise fool. Some of you may have uh, taken um, a Shakespeare class, or at least had Shakespeare in a class, and might have read King Lear. The wise, the, the, it's kind of Elizabethan stock character, the wise fool. He's the court jester. Uh, he's supposed to just be there and make everybody laugh, but but secretly he's the wisest guy around and, and the king's advisor. He speaks in jokes and riddles, but he's always uh, uh, checking the king. Uh, who's, starting to do something foolish and the king is listening to him because he's a wise fool. So I thought I'd put my fool in there and see what happens. Um, this includes a, a reference to the oldest, possibly the oldest joke in the world, why the chicken crossed the road. You won't know the answer to that, I see. Uh, if you don't, you're going to live in a cave. 
wise fool. <clears throat> Fools appointed the king's confidant and resident goofball, the mental power behind the throne, who speaks in jests and riddles. This is a big responsibility, thinks fool. Say the wrong thing and black. Even say the right thing in a slightly wrong way and watch the dominoes clatter into a black row, excuse me, clatter into a black row pointed straight at yours truly. So fool sticks to the chicken joke and the Randy Tinker stories laced with a couple of mossy ballads, hoping nobody will end up paying much attention to any of it. Though he finds himself hailed for the kingdom's golden year. The to get to the other side line alone turns an army revolt into a fife concert. Imagine fool surprise and relief till they need a beloved celebrity to burn for the smallpox epidemic. <laughs> Things never go well for my poor fool. I'm going to finish up with a uh, poem about um, a um, favorite occupation of mine during the 4th of July when I was a kid. Uh, okay. You all know what a cherry bomb is? Uh, do they have them still? The, 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 uh, the fireworks are those kind of fireworks are, are illegal in, in most states, except Missouri, we allow children to use dynamite. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of fun. <laughs> but when I was a kid, you could get, you could, you could mail order them, they'd come in a big crate, and we, we'd go down the, to the train station, and it'd be this big box, and it only cost like eight bucks, and you get a, like a ton of explosive, and it, and it said, it said Class C explosives on the box. You know, for a kid who's like nine years old, man, this is this is as good as it gets. Uh, so, the cherry bomb. And the, the cool thing about the cherry bomb, one of the cool things about cherry bombs, they were they were supposedly equal to a, a third of a stick of dynamite, which is exciting to start with. And uh, they 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 really blew shit up, you know. Uh, and also, the the other cool thing about them is that they the fuse. You know, they were looked like a cherry. They were a little red thing with a, with a green fuse on it, and that fuse would burn underwater. So that you could use them as depth charges if you weighted them, which we did, into the swimming pool at the country club, which our parents didn't belong to. <laughs> Very interesting effects. <laughs> Detonated you know, depth charge style. So this is called cherry bombs. <clears throat> the red red seeds of anarchy and blitz. So quick. So blunt, so right to boys who dreamed of fuse and detonation. They came, one fifth stick of dynamite, veiled in oriental understatement. Light fuse and step back. <laughs> Just a step, and our ears howl for half an hour, our faces puckered numb. We learned to toss them quick on Susie's lawn under love cars by the lake, <laughs> waited into swimming pools where beauties bobbed up flushed and muscle boys felt testicles retract like snail's horns. <laughs> you little pricks want to step out to the parking lot, they snarled. Blam, we answered. Blam, blam, blam. <laughs> Thank you.